Did you ever want to play The Simpsons Hit and Run on your computer? Maybe you saw someone playing with a funny yet horrifying realistic eyes mod and you might be thinking, wait, how am I going to get the game onto my PC? And how am I going to get mods onto it? Or could I just do this all on my original console? Eh, never mind, this is a waste of time. While I introduce you to the life-changing world of emulation, ROM hacks, and homebrewing, where you can make your wildest dreams come true of playing and modding any old games on almost any device you can imagine. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to divide these three into separate chapters, going in this order. Also, this is a brief history, so don't expect me to go into full detail, this is a mostly random mix of facts. All right, let's begin. Emulation is where you visit the most untrustworthy websites you will ever find just to download a PlayStation 2 emulator only to play the Family Guy video game. What? What? Stupid trash can. Look at it over there. If you have never heard of emulating games before, or I guess any of these topics, I don't know why you clicked on this video, but I respect it. To put it simply, you download some free emulation software, which will basically act like whatever console that is trying to emulate. Yes, I know I'm super smart for basically saying that an emulator emulates things. Then you obtain a ROM file. ROM meaning read only memory. This will also act like the game that you want to play. Put the ROM file into the emulator and boom, you have the game. How you obtain this ROM is all up to you, either ripping a game you already own or downloading from a most likely illegal site to obtain them. Now let's go back in time to 1963 where Twitter didn't exist and where IBM engineers first coined the term emulation specifically for computers. Before 1980, emulation was only referred to as hardware or microcode assistance, when actual software or nowadays video game emulation were called simulations. Some purists still want there to be this distinction to this day, but fuck those guys, I guess. Today, emulation means complete imitation of another device, inner workings and all, while simulation often refers to taking something from the real world and putting it into a virtual one to understand it better, such as a nuclear blast that incorporates variables such as heat, velocity, and radioactive submissions, or Microsoft Flight Simulator. Watch your jab, Watch your but now let's jump ahead 27 years to December 12th 1990 where Japanese man named Harusia Udagawa, god I hope I got that right, created a program called Family Computer Emulator version 0.35 that was able to run some simple Famicom games such as the original Donkey Kong or Space Invaders. Now this is where it gets a little bit muddy because this is the earliest game emulator I could find with an official date. There was this other emulator that I found called Landy NES and it was reportedly released in late 1990s. It could have been released earlier, but due to it not having an official date and also being classified as lost media, sucks to suck I guess. Who knows, there might have possibly been an earlier game emulator, maybe for the Atari or the Magnavox Odyssey. Side note, the Magnavox Odyssey was the first ever commercial home video game console. I just find it funny that it has this epic and cool sounding name just to look like a shitty prototype defibrillator. Alright sir, everything is ready to go. Uh... Why isn't it working? Oh no, why won't this console turn on? During 1995 to 1998 is where emulation gained more popularity due to better computers and emulators being created. Another reason why it got so popular is that a lot more consoles were able to be emulated such as the SNES, Genesis, Game Boy, PlayStation, and Nintendo 64. Also, there was this one NES emulator released back in 1997 called Nesticle. Man, these jokes write themselves. One of my favorite stories that came around this time was an emulator created on January 26, 1999 called Ultra HLE. It was an emulator for the Nintendo 64 and it was so well made that it was the first to actually run games at a playable speed on average computer specs at the time. Nintendo caught wind of this because it could have potentially been hurting the sales of the console due to the Nintendo 64 still being deemed profitable. And good old Nintendo decided to do a classic move by threatening legal action against the creators. Even a PR manager of the company said, Nintendo is very disturbed that the creators would design products that infringe on copyrighted works. 
I don't go to the store and see a bootleg cereal box and become quote unquote very disturbed. After the turn of the 21st century, more and more emulators showed up one after another, with more notable ones being Citra, Yuzu, Dolphin, MGBA, Duck Station, and plenty of others. You can basically find an emulator for almost anything from something universal like the PlayStation to something more obscure like the Wonderswan, including official emulators made by the same console manufacturers. Yep, those exist with a majority of these coming from Sony and Nintendo. Which makes the Ultra HLE story even weirder because you could have possibly hired these people instead of suing them, but no. Most of these official emulators were used for backwards compatibility or debugging. One that stood out to me was called Dolphin. And no, not that dolphin. This dolphin. Yeah, apparently these have no connection to each other, which makes me think that the unofficial dolphin must be a reference to this. Over the years, not only better software was being created to run games as fast as the original console, but the games look nicer as well due to better renders being made and used. I know that's subjective, saying that the game looks nicer, but still impressive nonetheless. To show you how much you can improve the graphics, this is The Simpsons Hit and Run with default emulation settings on Dolphin Emulator. And now with some minor adjustments, such as putting that at 1080p and some anti-aliasing, you can see what I mean. Now you can truly see the majestic and upstanding Homer Simpson and all of his low polygon greatness. Now let's move on to ROM hacks. Uh, why? Because I fucking said so? You're not the boss of me. Otherwise, if you are, then I'm really sorry. Please don't fire me. ROM hacks are basically modified versions of the original game, such as new Pokemon or new levels in Super Mario 64. Basically, anything is possible with some creativity and the skill of being able to use a hex editor. Just like regular game mods that give you the reaction, holy shit, this is so good, I would have paid money for this. A good amount of ROM hacks are better than the original game and even newer releases in the same franchise, Cough Cough Pokemon. There is no clear date in when the first ROM hack was created or uploaded online to the internet, but a good guess would be around mid to late 1980s. In those days, there would have been way more simple edits than what people do nowadays, something like sprite and game mechanic changes to new sound effects and translations. The earliest ROM hack I could find was one for Super Mario Bros called Tonkachi Mario being released in 1987. This ROM hack is pretty well known and I doubt it's the first ever but segues nicely into my next topic so... Tonkachi Mario is referred to as a Kaizo ROM hack which basically means made the game as difficult as possible while still being able to be done by a human. There's a huge amount of Kaizo ROM hacks for almost any game and plenty of nerds I mean people take these seriously enough and try to beat them. So seriously that there was an interview done by everyone's favorite website, thegamer.com, for someone who beat Emerald Kaiza, which is considered one of the hardest hacks ever created. Of course, not all ROM hacks are Kaizo. Some other genres of ROM hacks include ones that improve how the game is played by fixing certain features that can be seen as annoying or by generally mainstreaming the game. There are spooky and scary ones such as the well-known Super Mario World hack just called The with apostrophe in the front. This was also called Coronation Day, which which would have weirdly lined up with real world events if this video was made sooner. And more infamously, Pokemon Snakewood, which just look at this artwork, you know what you're getting yourself into with this. It just screams old internet creepypasta, it's just so amazing, I love it. While researching for this video, I stumbled across a Sonic 1 ROM hack called Sonic 1 Beta Hoax, which was made all the way back in 1999. The guy who created it, being called Cyan Helcarax, made it to stir up more interest within the on a community. This game included such amazing new features like no Sega sound, no title cards, no game over text when you run out of lives, the sound test screen is unreliable, beating the boss of some levels causes the game to crash, and my personal favorite, just simply waiting on the stage select screen for too long crashes the game. Hey, at least has more features than modern Call of Duty and Battlefield games though. This game tricked a decent amount of people into downloading it thinking it was a legitimate prototype of Sonic the Hedgehog for the Sega Gen. Genesis. I don't even know what type of ROM hack category this fits into, it's just so stupidly funny. Moving on, there are ROM hacks that add new content to the game like new areas, characters, and items. Some of these ROM hacks make it hard to go back to the original game to do how amazing they are. And finally, probably a lot of people's favorite type of ROM hack, the silly and wacky ones. 
Whoa, that's insane. That doesn't happen in the original game. What in the HE double hockey sticks? What the fuck am I saying? Wait a minute, how are ROM hacks even made? Most of them are made by hex editors, which are programs for editing slash modifying non-textual data. Also various specialized tools such as tile editors and game specific tools for editing levels, items, translations, etc. Some more advanced tools such as assemblers and debuggers are occasionally used as well. For example, Tonkachi Mario was made on an unlicensed code editor for the Famicom Disk System. This program was funnily enough called Tonkachi Editor, which translates to Hammer Editor and no, not the one by Valve. Uh oh, is that Nintendo here to ruin the fun again? Is that a cease and desist letter and takedown notices? And classic Nintendo strikes again. Now let's move on to home brewing because brewing at home is my favorite pastime. That was an awful joke, I'm sorry. Homebrewing, also called soft modding or jailbreaking, all of these are basically the same but with some minor differences. I am going to be using these terms interchangeably in this video, so uh, that's neat I guess. What all these terms mean is to install a hack onto a console that allows it to run software and other modifications that weren't intended or allowed by the developers. Homebrewing is pretty complicated, and methods of doing it can vary from system to system, but I'll try my best to briefly explain it. You'll either need an SD card or a USB drive to contain necessary files such as homebrewing apps to put into the console. Then you perform an exploit to cause a buffer overflow, which is a security vulnerability that can allow users to execute their own code. By doing this, you can install even more homebrewed apps and have a new modded console. Oh yeah, you also have to do update blocking, creating NAND backups, payloads, injectors, and some other stuff. And if you don't do this all correctly, you may potentially brick your device. Oopsie daisy, there goes a couple hundred bucks. If you don't feel like using a USB drive or an SD card, you can attempt to use a mod chip to homebrew. This requires you to physically attach them to the console through the use of a soldering iron. It's pretty obsolete nowadays due to soft modding, but it reminded me of this amazingly awful stock photo, so there's that. I have always found it weird on why it's called homebrewing. Like, I understand emulators and ROM hacks, but I still think ROM mods is a far superior name. Wait, actually, on second thought, never mind. But the term homebrewing means brew alcoholic drinks at home, and that doesn't make a lot of sense for software. Oh wait, the informal meaning is just to make it at home instead of in a store or factory. And software is the only example of informal homebrewing for some reason. Couldn't it just be called homemade or like home hack? How did these even get associated with one another, and why? I wouldn't be like, Oh grandma, this is such a nice homebrewed quote you got here, truly amazing. Every single console manufacturer tries to prevent these jailbreak attempts by eliminating the security vulnerabilities. And just like how there are security vulnerabilities in your house, Derek, yeah, this didn't work. Only the Xbox One and the Series X and S are the exception to this. There are videos going in more detail about this topic, but basically Microsoft made it very pointless to even try to jailbreak these consoles. One of these methods was for $20 you can purchase something called Xbox Dev Mode which allows you to run any type of code you want. This means that you can run almost any program which includes emulators and other homebrew apps. The only thing that you can't do is boot up an Xbox game, which sounds like a good deal to me. Usually modern consoles take around 1-4 to four years to be actually fully homebrewed on. I say fully because before the actual homebrew, there are a number of exploits found that can potentially lead to the full homebrew.
One of my favorite exploits I found while researching is an exploit for the Wii majestically called Letter Bomb. It used a malformed letter to cause a buffer overflow which loads a file called boot.elf into the Wii's memory. Just think of boot.elf as an exe file. This installs the homebrew channel to run unsigned code. Yeah, all that technical stuff is cool and all, but it reminds me of that pipe bomb in your mailbox meme so that just makes it 10 times better. One of the shortest times for a modern console to be homebrewed on was the Nintendo Switch. It was exploited 11 days after its release and then homebrewed on about a year later. And since the Xbox Series X and S haven't been homebrewed on and the Nintendo Switch has, this officially settles the debate over which console is superior. It's the PlayStation 5. In contrast, the PlayStation 3 took around 4 years to be homebrewed on. This was done by an open source exploit called PS Groove which uses the USB port to perform it. But to be honest, the main reason why I brought up the PS3 is to talk about somebody that you might have heard of before for his iOS jailbreaks. George Hotz, better known under his alias GeoHot, released the PlayStation 3's encryption keys in early 2011. Total disaster for Sony because this allows for any homebrew or custom firmware to be signed and run natively, essentially tricking the console into thinking nothing wrong is happening. Also, this key was used to prevent piracy, so yeah, you see the issue here. This would most likely require a voluntary recall, and the most expensive parts of the console would have to be replaced. All of this caused Sony to sue George Hotz and some associates of a group called Fail Overflow. What were the charges, you might be asking? Well, good question because charges included violating the DMCA, CFAA, copyright law, California CCDA, FA, breach of contract, torturous interference, misappropriation, and trespass. So yeah, a decent amount. And in a pure act of just sheer bad assery, the absolute legend George Hotz released a diss track to being sued by a fucking Fortune 500 company. Yo, it's Geo Hot. And for those that don't know, I'm getting sued by Sony. <laughs> Let's take us out of the courtroom and into the streets I'm a beast, at the least you'll face me in the northeast Uh, get my ire up, light my fire I'll go harder than Eminem when at Mariah Call me a liar, pound me in the ass Sony has been real quiet ever since this dropped Oh yeah, they decided to settle out of court While I was looking at different Hold on, sorry, I just want to listen to the diss track again No loop chafe fan, you're fucking with the dude who got the keys to your safe fan those that can't do bring suits, cry to your Uncle Sam to settle disputes. Truly amazing. Anyways, while researching for the video, I was looking around some message boards and I came across the everlasting argument between two separate groups of homebrewers. Ones that pirate games or other software and the ones who don't. What do I mean by this? Since homebrewing allows access to third party software, some people are very adamant that this should only be used for things like utility software, region free launchers, and running and modding games you keyword already own. While the opposite opinion not only uses everything I have said before, but they also use it to pirate slash emulate games or software. Some arguments I have seen are homebrewing is so much more than piracy and it's a lost sale for the developer and hurts the industry. And also, it's literally illegal, so... And the other side's arguments, this big company doesn't deserve money, or this game hasn't been on sale in like 16 years, also it's fucking Boogerman for the SNES, so who cares? Ease of access and whatnot, basically. And also the people who just like free stuff. But what I have seen most commonly, and yes, it's a cop-out answer, it heavily depends on the context of the situation due to it being very complicated. Homebrewing and custom firmware will always be linked to piracy in some way just due to the nature of being able to access any amount of third-party software you want. 
It's a never-ending flame war that is not only homebrewing related, but also ROM hacks and emulation as well. This has sort of casted a shadow onto these communities with some people being hesitant to join because they think they might be arrested for downloading. Yeah, I'm not going to be talking about the legality of these because do you really expect some guy with a lowercase username who has 87 subs on YouTube to give legal advice? Actually, that's not really that absurd now thinking about it. Also, of course, there are viruses around every other corner while trying to download any of these. But if you're not tech illiterate and don't download shit from totally not a virus, please trust us. Dot virus, you should be fine. Just do your own research before downloading anything, please. It's not that hard. It will save you from a lot of pain when you accidentally download a Peter Alert virus. Emulators, ROM hacks, and homebrewing is all thanks to talented developers creating these projects. Oh uh, fuck, how do I end this video? I talked about emulation, I talked about uh, ROM hacks, and um, I, I talked about ROM uh, homebrewing. Oh I know, uh, leave, get out of here. Scram, I don't want to fucking see you anymore. Welp, that was a nice video. <sighs> oh wait, you're still here? Well, I guess, uh, welcome to me rambling for like another 30 or so seconds. Make yourself comfortable, I guess? I don't know. Emulation, ROM hacking, and homebrewing have always been very interesting to me, and I hope I was able to share some fun but ultimately useless facts about these topics in a sort of historical way. Oh yeah, I found this super interesting read about the history of the PlayStation Vita's homebrew scene. It was made by Sumerian Eater, or Eiter. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I didn't know how to incorporate it into the main video part, but I did want to bring it up at the very least. I highly encourage you to read this if you're even slightly interested. I'll leave a link to it in the description. So yeah, this was my first video in this kind of style. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for watching to the end. The true end, if you will. Sub and like if you want. See ya.